All right, so this is our fourth part in the Phylum Nadaria lecture series, and we'll be, we should be able to wrap everything up with this one. Um, we are now finally on the last class of Nadaria, and this is class the Schizophones. So these guys are known as the common jellyfish. So we talked about box jellies. These guys are common jellies. By and large, you're going to see these guys as a Medusa body form. But the big identifying feature, what makes these different than the box jellies, is when we look at the Medusa, you know, there's your bell-shaped, Medusa-shaped, gastrovascular cavity up here. The tentacles aren't nearly as long proportional to the body as what we saw in the box jelly. So if we put a box jelly next to these guys, then the tentacles are significantly longer. So there's, for example, of a box jelly compared to common jelly. So that's one way to just visually distinguish the two, length of the tentacles in relationship to the actual body or the Medusa body plan here. Um, these guys, not nearly as painful. A lot of times you don't even notice the nematocysts if you've gotten stung by one of these jellies. Um, but the box jellies, you're going to know it. So again, I never would encourage just play with things in a marine environment. Just you know, grab stuff and hold on to it unless you know what you're playing with. Be very, very careful. Uh, there are lots of things that can lead to some significant problems if you grab the wrong thing in the uh, environment, the marine environment. Uh, the common jellies do have a little bit more mobility to them. They can actually move. They're not swimming against a current, but they definitely have more movement uh, compared to the uh, any of the other groups we've been looking at. There's and it's hard to see on this picture, but there's actually this little ring here of muscle within the epithelium. And when that muscle contracts, it creates a little bit of a jet propulsion. So it's not like they're <laughs> exploding through the water and zipping away from a predator or trying to zip towards prey. It just helps them kind of pulse and move slowly through the water column. So these guys, again, do have a little more directional movement than any of the other groups we've looked at. Uh, where this movement or this pulsing ability is most noticeable is in one of the very, very unique and special common jellyfish, one of the members of the Schizophoans here. And these guys are known as Cassiopeia. Now, Cassiopeia is a common jellyfish that is found in the mangroves, primarily in the mangrove environment of the marine ecosystem. So let me, get, oh, oh, let me show you guys kind of what we're looking at here. So these guys are known as the upside down jellyfish because they are literally, you saw in this picture here, upside down. They're a Medusa body plan, but the difference is the tentacles face upward. Now, most of the time in the mangroves, let me give you guys some reference here. All right, so here's the mangrove tree. They got these big, gnarly prop roots. And we'll talk about mangroves when we get into marine or the ecology and the marine biology side of this course. But the mangroves are a really cool ecosystem. Highly encourage you guys to play around in them. There's the bottom of the water. So the way this is going to work, the upside down jellies sit on the bottom of the sand in the mangroves and their tentacles are pointing upward. These guys actually have algae living inside of their their dome, if you want to call it that, the bell of the Medusa body plan here. 
So they're going to be in water that's fairly shallow. So there's your water column. It might only be 8, 10, 12 feet deep. That way sunlight can reach the bottom and the algae can photosynthesize and produce nutrients for the jellyfish. So it's kind of like that coral relationship with the zoanthellae. The algae inside the coral gives the coral oxygen and sugar. The algae inside the cassiopeia or upside down jellyfish does the exact same thing. Gives the jelly oxygen and sugar. The coral or the, uh, the algae has a place to live inside the jellyfish. So what's really crazy and cool and fun, but also you need to be careful, these guys tend to live in clusters or colonies. Yeah, you go into the mangroves, you might see 30, 40 of these upside down jellies in a given area. And these guys are a little temperamental. They are not happy. That's supposed to be a give them a frowny face. They're not happy when things disturb them. So what happens is when somebody goes snorkeling over the top of the jellyfish, it disturbs the water column. So there's your snorkeler swimming over the top and creating waves that make the jellyfish mad. So now the jellyfish get upset and it does not take physical touch for them to discharge their nematocysts. We see that in the other jellies and the other members of Nadaria. Physical touch on that trigger causes the release or the discharge. These guys, they just start discharging when they get agitated because the water column has been disturbed too much. Yeah, they, they don't do it if there's a storm or things like that. But if predators or something swim over the top, they start discharging their nematocysts up into the water column. Now the first snorkeler through, usually you're okay. You're like, hey, I, uh, I got through and I'm all the way over here now and I'm past all those little torpedoes that they've just shot up into the water and I'm doing okay. So that snorkeler's got the smiley face. But the second snorkeler, or if there's a third snorkeler back here that's swimming behind you, those individuals are gonna swim directly into the discharge of those nematocysts. That's not going to be very pleasant for number two or three or four in, in the line of snorkelers. So if you're ever snorkeling in the mangroves and you guys know there are upside down jellyfish there, the Cassiopeia, be in the front and watch the direction of the water. You don't want to be snorkeling down current because those nematocysts will get discharged and they'll drift down current with you. Swim against the current. That way... The nematocysts are going this way, you're snorkeling this way, and you'll snorkel through them. But what you may notice is all of a sudden you feel all these little stings on you, like somebody's poking a bunch of hot needles into your skin. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to go through your shirt, your bathing suit. If you have a dive skin on, it'll never penetrate that. But your face that's exposed, or if you're just wearing a pair of shorts or whatever swimsuit, any exposed skin can get hit with these things and you're not going to have a good day with it. So it's not as bad as the box jellies, but it is a little unnerving to feel all these dozens of stings on you when you're in the water, you're going to think something's attacking you. So, but the common jelly, again, by and large, the nematocysts are not bad. Um, these guys just, kind of float around in the, in the water column. They can move themselves, a little bit of that jet propulsion, and they're just feeding off of whatever plankton they can get a hold of. Doesn't matter what it is, they're gonna grab it with their tentacles, pull it in, digest it, absorb the nutrients in that gastrovascular cavity, and just carry on. Uh, they are a major food source for sea turtles. So there's a good thing for turtles they like to eat jellyfish the problem jellyfish often resemble bags 
So when we have trash in the water, like a plastic baggie floating through the water, turtles get confused, look at this and go, oh, looks like a jellyfish, what I normally eat, and wind up eating plastic bags that humans have put into the ocean, intentionally or unintentionally. So, okay, so those are all the members of phylum Nidaria. Now, what I do want to do next, just briefly, since there's not much here, is jump into phylum Tenophora. Now, this is kind of a goofy, weird group. Uh, there's only one example here to talk about, but phylum Tenophora are known as the comb jellies, the sea, wa or sea walnuts, and sea gooseberries. Those are all members of phylum Tenophora. All right, so this is an actual picture I took of a member of Tenophora. It's a weird, goofy shape thing. It does look like a jellyfish, but let me put the big butts up here. Let me get to the next box. The difference is here. No stinging cells. This is why these guys are in their own phylum. They do not have nidocytes or nematocysts. There's no harpoons. There's no toxins. There's none of that. Instead, they have these little cilia with sticky combs. Oh. That capture prey. So imagine that, uh, if you're using a comb for your hair and all those little blades on the comb, little sticky pads, anything that touches it gets stuck and then they can draw that in and eat that and consume the food that's attached to those little combs. Uh, some of them have little bits of bioluminescence to them. Uh, this guy here, you can see just a touch of it. I'll use yellow to point it out. Across the top here, there's this line going like this. There's another line right here. There's another line here. So these are little bioluminescent lines of tissue embedded within the body. So they'll use that to help uh, communicate between each other, between members of the same species, for whatever comb jellies want to communicate about. Who knows what. Um, in general, they do just kind of drift around with the water column. Not a lot of directional movement because they don't have a lot of muscle to them. But what is really cool is that these guys have a very crude brain slash neural system. So some research has shown there is very, very rudimentary neurological ability here. And no, they're not learning complex problems but they do have enough of a neural system that it aggregates together to form a very, very primitive brain structure. So keep in mind, jellyfish, the Darians, these guys, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. This may be the first group to actually have anything that we would call a brain system. Think about where we're at as mammals, as humans with the complexity of our brain. What could we learn from the brain of this animal? Do we have parallel structures, similarities, things like that? Did our brain ultimately evolve from the primitive brain of a member of Tenophora? So, all right, so I'm going to leave you guys with the soundtrack from diving. I would highly encourage you as a biologist explore this world at some level even if you're saying hey i'm going into medical i'm going into i'm going to be a pa i'm going to go into pharmacy learn a little bit about it the marine ecosystem has immense value to the human species we're getting medicines from it we get food from it we make money from it it keeps the land ecosystems functioning we need to remember what we do on land does eventually wind up in the ocean. So, all right, those are the numbers of Nodaria and Tenophora.